fine. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't feel like I believe. Yeah. Because I'm always going back and forth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 But you made Let me work. write myself. Yeah. 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 Um, would you believe? I found there we go. This can presentation you know. is working, okay. so you can use it to flip between slides if you want, or you can use the last. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. I'm so glad you came. Of course, I was really yeah. early, but then I had, I had like an appointment on campus, so I couldn't get here. Yeah. And then, of course, I was trying to figure out like, you know, who's going to get Avery. Oh, he's you know, he's at, yeah. all the way to Detroit. Like, the traffic is so bad to get back down you know, this way. So I'm like, can you swing? Yeah. 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 And he was like, I'm not sure. Well, you got to know. Right. This was on the joint calendar. Right. It was right. on the joint <laughs> calendar. Like, you're those kind of people now. It's like, yeah. you know, you get to that point. I'm like, I put it on there. I invited him. Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> 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 together, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, text me so that I have it. Like, yes. Okay. 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 I didn't try. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. But they were 
number of papers, and people were like coming and going as they do it. Yeah, Berkeley does that too. It's, 
And then what we end up in is the weird middle space between if it's a class, it starts 10 after. But if it's an administrative meeting, it starts on the hour. But what about a faculty meeting? Is that more like a class? That's exactly a more like a... <laughs> so there's these times where nobody knows what time it actually starts. When your mom watches you give a talk, does she ask you about it? Like, you guys talk about it? So welcome, colleagues. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Simona Golden, and I direct the Teaching Work Seminar Series. Uh, it's so wonderful to see all of you here at the beginning of March uh, for the fourth Teaching Work Streaming Seminar Series talk of the 2018-2019 academic year. We are, as you know, focused on the theme how does knowing content matter for disrupting the persistence of oppression? And the key question, what is the relationship between advancing justice and the teaching of content? We now find ourselves together deeply inside of this course that we're co-constructing with the guidance and the wisdom of a series of really fantastic speakers. And together we've been exploring what the relationship is between the special nature of knowing content in teaching and the work of seeing and of hearing children's ideas with subject matter and of supporting their learning and their growth. So where have we been and what are we, what are we building on together today? Together we have, with the guidance of Dr. La Gloria Latson billings explored the social funding of race and of how schools are a key site for citizenship and human rights contestation how the inclusion and also the exclusion of students from school has been a major site of conflict. 
Regarding the curriculum, Dr. Ladson Billings elaborated how the school's advertised curriculum can be another site for the funding of race and how the persistent use of the terms we and ours is used to silence many and exclude them. After Dr. Ladson Billings, we uh, welcomed Dr. Marcel Haddix, who joined us next in thinking about teaching as a revolutionary act and how we both can and must use writing as a form of social change and of activism. She began her talk by asking us, why do you dare to teach? I've been thinking of that question ever since. And then she considered, how can we disrupt the culture of surveillance and violence inside of our schools? And what she said was, go for broke by working for both freedom and for liberation. In our most recent seminar series talk, we were joined by Dr. Beth Rubin in January, whose scholarship investigates how young people see themselves as citizens and the way that civic identity takes shape in the local context in which children are developing marked by both historic and contemporary inequalities. Dr. Rubin began her talk by arguing that the norms and the conventions of classrooms are not and maybe never neutral that these norms and conventions shape and restrict what young people come to believe about this nation and about its past and about its present. She noted that curriculum is about what she called memory making and that when teaching social studies, every single teacher in every single classroom must consider whose memory and whose history we teach if they are to strive towards equity and teaching towards equity. So today's panel discussion, it's complementary to, um, to these previous seminars, but it's also slightly different. So instead of asking today's panelists to consider what is involved in knowing and using a particular content, whether that be mathematics or social studies or English language arts or science, we've asked today's panelists a different but I believe corresponding question. We've asked them to consider how we might expand the canon and specifically, what other disciplines we might include inside of our K-12 schools if we were to truly illuminate and nurture and grow the students' brilliance inside of those classrooms? What areas of discipline, of study, of hybrid fields we've asked them to nominate for inclusion and why? And how would its inclusion help to disrupt the inequality that is so pervasive inside of our schools? And last, just to make this especially difficult, we asked them also to consider what this might mean for our teacher education. So I am really just thrilled to be here at this day that we've planned and designed and dreamed about for nearly a year. Um, and I really cannot wait for the provocative ways that Dr. Tuck and Dr. Dr. Nasir will challenge and will support and will engage our learning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the structure of today's panel. It's a little bit different than how we've done things before. My colleague, Deborah Ball, will introduce our speakers, as she does each time. And then we will hear first from Dr. Eve Tuck and then from Dr. Naila Suad Nasir. Following their presentations, we'll have a short bit of quiet time for you to first think about what you've heard, to do some journaling for yourself, and then to, as Eve Tuck called it, peer review your questions with a colleague sitting near you to talk about what you'd like to ask, to really critique and think carefully about the question that you're posing and get feedback on it from your friend. Um, today we'll be taking questions via Twitter. So we'll ask you to tweet your questions to TW Seminar. And if you don't tweet, which even I can do, so I know you can, but if you don't tweet, um, you can ask your colleague or your friend to tweet your questions for you. And now my colleague Deborah will introduce our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see all of you here, and I also welcome all of you who are watching online from a variety of locations around the building, the state, the country, the world. Um, it's really my great honor and joy to welcome both of you here, so I'll take a few minutes just to introduce you um, to our 
guests here today. So I'll go in alphabetical order. Um, Dr. Naila Suad Nasir, I have great pleasure in saying, is the sixth president of the Spencer Foundation, which supports research and education. Um, as many of you know, she was a faculty member at the University of California, Berkeley, um, since 2000. Um, but in her last few years, a couple of years, I guess, at Berkeley, was served as the vice chancellor of equity and inclusion um, from November 2015 until 2017. Um, she earned her PhD in educational psychology at UCLA and was a member of the faculty of the School of Education at Stanford before moving to Berkeley. Her work, as I think lots of people in this room know, focuses on issues of race, culture, learning, and identity, and she's the author of Racialized Identities, Race and Achievement for African American Youth. She's published lots of articles that many people in the room have learned from and studied and savored, um, and she's a member of the National Academy of Education and a fellow of the American Educational Research Association. Um, in 2016, she um, got a very well-deserved award from Division G for mentoring. I um, have learned a lot from Naila from our joint, um, I don't know what I would call them, conversations, commiserations, conferring, sharing about some of the challenges of leadership and particularly um, learning to exercise leadership around issues of equity and justice in institutions like ours and institutions like Berkeley, um, complicated work. And I benefited hugely from Naila's wisdom when I was um, still in the role more explicitly of leadership, but we're all trying to lead for equity. And so the kinds of things that I've learned from you, Naila, are really important to me. Um, so we're really glad that you made the time to be here. I'm also delighted to welcome Eve. Dr. Eve Tuck um, is Associate Professor of Critical Race and Indigenous Studies at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, sometimes referred to as OISE, at the University of Ontario. She's the Canada Research Chair of Indigenous Methodologies with Youth and Communities. She's also a William T. Grant Scholar um, over this period from 2015 through 2020. And she was also a Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow um, a few years ago. Um, Dr. Taka Zunangach and is an enrolled member of the Aleut community of St. Paul um, Island, Alaska. Um, her writing has challenged me, helped me grow, helped me think in ways that I didn't before I began to encounter Dr. Tuck's writing. I actually first got to know Dr. Tuck last year in, or maybe two years ago when I was charged with the responsibility of trying to figure out a, um, a theme for the ARI meeting. Uh, thinking us being in New York and thinking about how to grow that theme in ways that were encompassing of a variety of voices, methods, and was uh, had an opportunity to um, meet you and confer with you. And there were many ways in which you helped me thinking about the theme, thinking about New York, thinking about place, and many other things. And I'm still learning from you as your student over time. Um, I think for many of us here, we know that at your, her work focuses on how indigenous social thought can be engaged to create more fair and just social policy, more meaningful social movements, and when that doesn't work, robust approaches to decolonization. I think um, we will stand to be quite challenged and provoked this afternoon, as Simona said, uh, this being, I think, one of the challenging sets of questions that we asked uh, Dr. Nasir and Dr. Tuck to address. And as Simona said, we're going to experiment with a somewhat different way of curating and managing the way we interact about the ideas that we'll hear this afternoon. But for now, I'm really so pleased you're both here. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nasir and Dr. Tuck. Can you hear me okay? I have copies of my talk for people in the room who would like to read along. Where are the copies? Okay, so for those of, do you have them if you want them? Okay, cool. Uh, thank you for this very generous invitation to spend some time with you this afternoon and 
also thank you for the, the very kind introduction. It's meant a lot to get to know you and to um, have the opportunity to think with you. And so thank you for those words, Dr. Ball. Uh, it's, it's good to be with you this afternoon. And, and thank you for those of you who are tuning in on the live stream, including, I think, my mom. I think my mom is out there watching. And um, so thank you to, so much to the Teaching work staff who've been really beautiful hosts and have helped my mom find the live stream link. Uh, as, as Dr. Ball shared in the introduction, I live and work in Toronto, and uh, I live and work in Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory there in Toronto. And it's been so neat, uh, I was sharing earlier today, it was neat to get on an airplane and fly for an hour and then get in a car and drive for an hour and still be in Anishinaabe territory. And so it's, it's uh, powerful to see the, the big space of this place and to know um, more about uh, the big responsibilities that Anishinaabe people have and have had since time immemorial in order to take care of this place. Um, and, and it's really a pleasure and an honor to work and live on, on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee land um, and to raise my children in Anishinaabe territory, Haudenosaunee land. Um, I am from, my community is in Alaska, and um, my dad's family is from Pennsylvania, and I grew up near where my dad's family is from in Pennsylvania, and that matters for the way that I begin my talk today. So I attended elementary school in a very small town in Pennsylvania that had more cows than people. And I remember with all of my senses the time that a teacher told our class that Native Americans are extinct. We were learning about what she was calling Woodlands Indians, the Susquehannock and the Conestoga. And it wasn't that she was saying that those communities were extinct. She told us that Native Americans more broadly are extinct. My very real, not extinct self sat in that classroom. My face was hot and my whole body felt like it was on fire. I thought of all the very real, not extinct people in my family. My mother was a respected teacher in that same school. Her classroom was just down the hallway. She was well known for her extensive curriculum development on indigenous communities. Many teachers used her lessons in their classrooms. And several years later, my grandmother would move just about a mile away from us and would become a frequent class guest to teach about Unangan culture. The teacher who said that Native Americans are extinct was not unaware that my family is Alaska Native. She even had a sort of friendship with my mom, having visited our house several times. Our presence in that school and in that Pennsylvania town was not one of secrecy about our indigeneity. So in that room, that teacher was doing another kind of work. She was working to characterize colonization as at a certain point in time, sometime in the 1600s, and so long ago that no one survived it. She was not openly contradicting my mother's presence as an indigenous woman. She was making it clear that whatever sort of native we were, it wasn't the same, or we weren't as native as the people who had been cleared of their homelands to create Pennsylvania or the US nation state. She was making a counterclaim by which indigenous peoples are defined by having been disappeared or destroyed. To have survived the apocalypse was unthinkable. Anyone who continues to claim to be indigenous is just a white person with a long lost grandma with high cheekbones, just like all the other white people with long lost grandmas. This is what is so revealing about Elizabeth Warren's insistence that she is Cherokee. 
In this is insistence, she reveals how little she knows about what it means to be indigenous, what it means to be Cherokee in an ongoing way. She reveals that she thinks that indigenous people are making a thin claim in the same way that she does. In this paper, I will talk about the content knowledges that I believe that teachers need in order to move towards justice for indigenous peoples. I will discuss what I believe teachers might learn from the discipline of indigenous studies. Indigenous studies is a field which not only includes and links fields of indigenous studies, native studies, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander studies, Alaska Native studies, Kanaka Maoli studies, but also attends to and sustains important differences between these fields. Indigenous studies is a more contemporary name for many of these longer term disciplinary projects, many coming out of the 1970s. Elizabeth Cook Lynn has described that the core projects of Native American studies, um, in particular, as being concerned with indigenous sovereignty and indigenous land. She notes that the key feature of Native American studies is the endogenous study of indigeneity by indigenous peoples. Linda Tuhiwai Smith, Sean Wilson, Margaret Kovach, and others describe corresponding central commitments within Indigenous studies emerging in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Botswana. Indigenous studies often attends to theories, constructions, and perspectives and ontologies of Indigenous communities. In the recent introduction to an edited volume on Indigenous and Decolonizing Studies in Education that I co-wrote with Linda Tuhiwai Smith and Kei Wei Yang, I confessed that I have become frustrated by the ways that Indigenous Studies scholarship is taken up in the Settler Academy. For most of my career, I have advocated for the centrality of Indigenous social thought in fields of education. Most of my interventions have focused on the possibilities afforded by attending to Indigenous writings, worldviews, teachings, approaches to relationship, ethics, histories, and futurities. I have done this because I am convinced that indigenous texts, for the most part, do the work to teach readers how these texts need to be read. One extended analogy that I have made to describe the relationship between indigenous social thought and Western theory is that of the New York City subway system. For other New Yorkers in the room. I was a New Yorker for much of my adult life. I left that Pennsylvania town really quick. And I hold the New York City subway system in very high regard. So note that I am talking about the network of trains and tracks and not the company that runs the trains. A map of the crisscrossing routes is something to behold. Trains go all over that city, taking one below rivers, beneath stone and skyscrapers, above avenues and through the most sacred parts of the city. Subway lines route from this corner to the next corner, from this neighborhood to that beach. Entryways from the street are well marked, often with a glowing green ball or one that glows red to convey that it is closed for now. Signs from the street indicate downtown only or uptown only, and where a train will go to and not go to is clearly marked on the platforms. For me, thinking of this underground world of connectivity and travel and hubs and pathways is a good way to think about indigenous knowledges. Indigenous knowledges have many of these characteristics and are usually signposted. This will take you in this direction, but not in this direction. This is open for you now. This is how you get to your destination, but this is also how you get to other destinations. To extend this analogy, sometimes listening to a person who is trying to understand something by only engaging Western theory is like listening to a person who keeps trying to take a taxi cab in rush hour traffic. They complain about getting stuck, 
the slow ride, the cost of the trip. Being an Indigenous scholar in the Settler Academy is like listening to someone go on and on about the dilemmas of cab rides while knowing that the subway system is just beneath the surface. Again, I feel that I have spent much of my time in education encouraging people to take just a short journey on the subway or at least check out a map. I feel like I've been standing at the subway entrance calling to colleagues and students as they hop into their individual taxi cabs into gridlock traffic. And I find myself less willing to do this now. I am weary after so many conference presentations in which indigenous scholars present work and then someone in the audience asks them a question that expects them to do just more work. In a conversation with Simona Golden that we had so that I could learn about this year's speaker series, I asked about the focus on content knowledge and not pedagogy or dispositions. Simona said that prior iterations of the speaker series had attended to dispositions and that this year you wanted to con uh, focus on content knowledge. I have tried to really think through this in this paper because in the times that I have reflected on the story with my elementary school teacher that it shared with you before, I likely would have characterized the need for intervention to be at the level of her disposition. In that moment, I knew that my teacher was a liar and I didn't trust another word that came from her that year. I remember this so vividly because it was the first time that I had to spend day in and day out with somebody that I couldn't trust. It changed my relationship to her. It changed my relationship to other teachers with whom I would never assume that I could trust again, but instead would hang back until I thought that maybe I could trust them. It changed my relationship to other students, especially those that still loved her. Years later, when I read James Lowen's book, Lies My Teacher Told Me, it occurred to me that by then, many of the other students in that class probably knew that she was a liar too. Whether the untruths in our teaching are known in real time by students who lived experience contradicts what we are espousing, or whether it is many years later that a student learns the real history. It cannot be our lasting goal as educators to be known liars. This paper is a discussion on the content knowledges that teachers might learn and bring to their classrooms in order to stop lying to their students. Many of these content knowledges are foundational ideas in Indigenous studies. As I worked to write about these ideas, a challenge emerged. Indigenous, study, uh, indigenous communities are place specific and what can be said about all indigenous communities has more, in my opinion, to do with relationships to violent nation states. So it's hard to say something that's gonna be universally true across all indigenous communities but we can say a lot about the shared experiences of interacting with violent nation states, which is part of the way that indigenous peoples become racialized, part of the ways that we become structured in settler societies. I think there's a lot that we can say about that. Thus, approaches to learning about these specificities are also specific. In some places, there will be tribal governments and historians with a public-facing website designed to bring accurate and respectful information to learners outside of their communities. Many communities have genealogists who will help sort out whether a person is a descendant or not, whose land your house is on, and how it came to be removed from communal, communal indigenous holdings, or they have staff members who give public presentations. However, in many places, communities have been removed, sometimes multiple times, and the official tribal government may be many states away from the places people lived before removal. 
In these cases, the government website employees may or may not have a lot of materials about the relationships to land people had before removals. And I'm describing this as like not a lost history, but missing infrastructure. In other cases, the information comes up first, that comes up first when doing a Google search is problematic. These are the half-abandoned websites written in italic and bold, Times New Roman font, lime green text on a yellow, lemon yellow background, partial versions of somebody's 10th grade history paper or master's thesis. The information here is almost always about dead Indians, told from a point of view that puts Indian in a static place and time. Their only purpose is to die there and stay there. A through line in work by Anishinaabe author Gerald Visner's writings is that Indian, with a lowercase i, is not a reference to real indigenous people, but instead an empty category that contains all of the fantasies of conquest put on by settlers. The Indian, for Visner, doesn't exist. The Indian is a settler invention and has never referred in any real or meaningful way to indigenous peoples. Visner's analysis is certainly reflected in legal findings and laws that make clear that Indian, with a capital I, is a legal and racial category with diminished rights in relation to white citizens of Canada or the US. So I did a quick Google search for Susquehannock people, the land and people where I was in school in Pennsylvania. The isomorphism of the websites that come up is striking. Whereas I don't want to spend the energy conducting a content analysis on something that is so obvious, the number of times that the phrases warlike, noble, and indeed extinct are used betrays the logics of this genre. Nearly every account emphasizes how physically intimidating their bodies were to the settlers. I say all this to name that many of the resources, especially those that come up first in an online search, are inadequate and are written to imagine the quote-unquote Indian as, an, as the empty signifier that Visner has critiqued rather than indigenous people as people. This is a consequence of settler colonialism that is evident as, even as we work to contest it. The lime green, bold, and italic font on yellow background websites are what educators much, must contend with, and their students. The critical thinking and stamina and curiosity and professional obligation that teachers must, must enact in order to wade through all of the misinformation is certainly why attending closely to dispositions will always be important to this work. However, there are content knowledges that are central to sorting, sorting through which sources to trust and which sources to discard. The first is that settler colonialism is ongoing. I have been writing and learning about settler colonialism in my scholarship for nearly 15 years, and I have described settler colonialism in seemingly countless publications and presentations. Considering what remains important within those descriptions is that settler colonialism is a different formation of colonialism that is, uh, than the formation of colonialism that is often taught about in US schools. This is not to say that settler colonialism is exceptional. If anything, it is far too typical and there are ongoing settler colonial societies in Canada, the United States, Israel, Brazil, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, and in many other places around the world. Settler colonialism has unfolded and is being maintained in particular ways in each of those places and in specific and particular places within those places. But having grown up in the United States and having studied the standardized K through 12 curriculum in many states, it seems important to note that colonialism 
if it is taught as, at all, is often taught as something that happens just at the very start of the nation state, or as something that happens over there for tea or spices or gold. Settler colonialism is a societal structure in which invaders come and claim land for themselves and shatter the lives of the people who were living there before. They do this through genocide, assimilation, containment on reserves, and political restriction, through residential schooling, placing pipe, uh, children in care, withholding access to clean water, and building pipelines and mining sites in sovereign lands. Children in settler societies are taught that invasion was only at the start of the story, and while it was unfortunate, there is nothing that can be done about it now. Thus, relevant content knowledge is that settler colonialism is ongoing, not something that just happened a long time ago. There is no need to worry about whether one can apologize for the terrible things one's ancestors did in order to violently found a nation state. The occupation is ongoing. Your descendants will also get the opportunity to worry about whether they can or should apologize for the things that you are doing right now to benefit from ongoing land theft. That was 400 years ago, or get over it, people will say. But in the scheme of time in which indigenous people have been in relation to these lands for more than 15,000 years, 400 years is still very much within the time frame to create a corrective. We are in the epoch of ongoing occupation of indigenous lands. From Saidia Hartman's work on the afterlife of slavery, slavery the companion to the violence of occupation in the United States and Canada, I have learned that there is no repair. There is no recuperation to the rupture of transatlantic slavery. Hartman's work affirms a choice away from the project of repairing the apocalypse that indigenous people have experienced because of settler colonialism. The relevant content knowledge are that, are that those forms of knowledge that disbelieve in the notion of progress or linear movement away from an earlier violent past toward an incrementally better future. The second kind of content knowledge that is important for teachers to learn and teach concerns the specific indigenous nations or communities in relation to which we live and work. For reasons I've already discussed, the accuracy of this, of this information is crucially important, and settler colonialism itself is the root reason for the many barriers that non-Indigenous people have to accurate and respectful information. I believe that schools of education can have a meaningful role to play in teaching teachers to vet content knowledge about Indigenous communities but also creating and curating trustworthy materials in university curriculum centers and libraries. Although this may initially seem outside of their purview, curriculum and pedagogy centers are ideally positioned to conduct research and engage with community elders and traditional teachers to learn about historical and ongoing cultural and language practices and relationships to land and waters. Investments by universities, especially, especially faculties of education, in curating, translating, soliciting, and creating trustworthy curriculum materials are a material way for universities to undo the erasure of this material, um, of this information from curriculum and classrooms. The purpose of lean, learning and teaching this content knowledge is to emphasize indigenous communities as contemporary communities with long pasts and long futures. It is important that P through 12 curriculum attend to the contributions of indigenous communities to science, mathematics, health and physical education, arts, language arts, political science, sociology and environmental studies. Indigenous sovereignty is a concept that would be meaningfully taught recursively across and throughout the curriculum so that understandings of self-determination, jurisdiction, and mutuality are deeply understood by non-Indigenous students. 
The third category of content knowledge that I believe is important for teachers to engage involves familiarity and respect for knowledge protocols of that particular territory. And at first this may sound like the same thing that I've just said, but I think it's quite different. So this is, of course, related to accurate and respectful knowledge about the indigenous hosts of the lands and waters in which we work and live. But learning and teaching content knowledge in knowledge protocols means understanding how land and waters want us to learn. For example, the medicines of a particular place have agency for how a, mighty, a meeting might begin, for how one is supposed to ask an elder to teach her something, for how one lets go of the feelings of anxiety and harm that come from an unhealthy verbal exchange and for how something ends. Teachings about medicines, teachings about making requests and asking for directions and how to begin and what and who to thank in order to begin in a good way are teachings that come from the land and waters, from the specific land and waters that we are in relation to when we are in a place. So these teachings are encoded with information only for certain peoples at certain stages of life, but much of what is there is there for everybody to be responsible for. The Indigenous Education Network at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, where I work, has offered medicine teachings in the four sacred medicines of that territory for years. Oise's traditional Kukumis, Jacques Lavallee, has offered teachings in sage, sweetgrass, tobacco, and cedar for the past seven or eight years. But it has only been recently, I think in the last 12 months or so, that we have made clear that to participate in the teachings, one must offer Kukumis some tobacco. The teachings are usually attended by non-Indigenous people or Indigenous people who are from outside of the territory, like me. Like, I went to these teachings because I am not from a place where those medicines grow. Often, the idea that one must offer the traditional teacher tobacco before the teachings begin makes people panic a little bit. Um, I get phone, we get phone calls, and our colleague Julie Blair at the IEN gets stopped in the hallway, where do I buy the tobacco, and what kind of tobacco, and how do I wrap it, and how do I present it? These are the common questions, and people new to these conversations, these seem like things that would be in the teachings, not something that you need to figure out before you do the teaching. And then if you ask an indigenous person, they're going <laughs> to tell you, like, well, actually, we don't buy tobacco. Like, it's part of our, our relationship with that medicine is not to purchase it. And so then people are... Uh, really confused. Um, but that begins to let you know what it's like to live in a city in which we can't grow medicines and don't have access to the medicines that are really important in terms of how you ask somebody to teach you a specific thing. So we don't have, um, we don't have the answers to those questions and they're not the right questions. That's part of why we don't have the answers. We would not try to buy medicines, and how you would wrap it is different than how I would wrap it. But it's important for people, especially learners, to know that this is how this kind of teaching has to begin, because this is what the land taught us. Every place has a way that things begin. Every place has a way that things end, and... Every place has ways that we do things in a good way and take care of our relations. These have been learned through the relationships that indigenous people have had with lands and waters for millennia. While issues of cultural appropriation and then of course using a little bit of information to do a lot of harm are things to be concerned about, I believe that the land wants us to do some things in certain ways. I believe that when we learn to follow these protocols, that we are activating relations to land and relations to each other that matter for what can be possible in our interactions. It's important to respect and attend to land's agency in our seemingly only human-to-human -human exchanges. <laughs>
In many ways, this is not a call for land acknowledgement, but to acknowledge the sentience of land, as Sandra Stiers has written about, and is a, a through line through teachings of, of many teachers in the territory that I live and work. In Canada, over the past decade or so, land acknowledgements have become more prominent, and almost any Indigenous person that you talk to will have an opinion about them and how other people are doing them. I will say that I think that land acknowledgements are hollow when they are read, mispronounced at the start of an event, and then set aside. I feel cynical about acknowledgements that then go tell you where the washrooms are and then how to get your parking validated. But I know that before I go to a place, I ask around to find out about the people of that place, the history of removals, perhaps the ongoing violences or fights against mascots or the, solitary, the experiences of the solitary indigenous student or the solitary indigenous professor. Before I speak in public, I do set an intention that my words and actions in a place are in right relation to the people who have taken care of these lands and water since time immemorial. But for you to take my words and make them into something you say is missing the point of acknowledging land. Marcia McKenzie and I have written a book called Place and Research about the ways that place is often ignored in social science research. This is a function of the ongoingness of settler colonialism. That place is only um, considered, if at all, as the backdrop of human activity. A few years ago, it was fashionable for some environmental justice scholars to call for quote unquote re-inhabitation that is to renew relationships to place. The problem was they skipped right over relationships to indigenous people who had maintained longstanding reciprocal relationships with land and waters. So the common, almost comical, if it wasn't so deadly mistake that non-indigenous people make is that they think that they just need to relate differently to place, ride bicycles or take fewer showers or go vegan, while still occupying indigenous land and ignoring indigenous sovereignty. Re-inhabitation is yet another form of erasure and occupation. One of the core uh, uh, concerns of place-based education is facilitating meaningful relationships to place. Indeed, because of human-caused carbon emissions, and other dangers to climate stability, this work is necessary in part to cultivate the humility needed to ensure the future of places. As Marcia McKenzie and Kate McCoy and I have argued, the praxis of place-based education have forwarded important discussions that would otherwise have been silenced. Yet the environmental education literature has replicated some of the very problematic assumptions and imperatives of settler colonialism. A core preoccupation of settler colonial nation states is the full erasure of indigenous peoples so that settlers can make themselves native. Um, historically, a desire to live on indigenous land and to feel connected to it bodily, emotionally, spiritually has been the normative formation of settlers, writes settler scholar Scott Morganson. Indeed, as Morganson continues, settler radicals who commit to indigenous decolonization must act differently. Morganson writes, decolonization does not follow if settlers simply study and emulate the lives of indigenous people on indigenous land. This is relevant in particular to those for whom anarchism links them to communalism and counterculturalism, such as rural communes, permaculture, squatting, hoboing, foraging, and neo-pagan, earth-based, and new age spirituality. Morganson continues, these quote-unquote alternative settler cultures formed by occupying and traversing stolen indigenous land and often by practicing cultural and spiritual appropriation. They must ask then if their interest is to support indigenous people arose not from an investment in decolonization, but in recolonization. <clears throat> 
re-inhabitation and replacement, to be clear, is entirely concerned with settler futurity, which always indivisibly means the continued and complete eradication of the original inhabitants of a contested land. Anything that seeks to recuperate and not interrupt settler colonialism, to reform the settlement, and incorporate indigenous peoples into the multicultural settler colonial nation state is fettered to indigenous, uh, is fettered to settler futurity. In contrast, indigenous futurity forecloses settler colonialism and settler epistemologies. This does not mean that indigenous futurity forecloses living on indigenous land by indig non-indigenous peoples. That is to say that indigenous futurity does not require the erasure of non-indigenous peoples in the ways that settler futurity requires of indigenous peoples. Thus, the specific interventions that indigenous land education can offer place-based and environmental educators and researchers have to do with the refusal of replacement and replacement discourses in place-based education and the refusal of settler futurity as the referent of, of the purpose of, of justice. Along these lines, there are important investments for teachers, teacher educators, and teacher education researchers to make as individuals, and for universities to make as entities that hold wealth because of how they have benefited from settler colonialism. There are archives dedicated to indigenous communities, pedagogies, governance, and justice that need investment in order to be established or sustained. There are curriculum writing projects both for school settings and out of school settings that require investment. It is important to remember that wherever you live and work, there is probably somebody already doing this work. And while it is of course possible that nobody has thought to create an archive or write curriculum, it is more likely that somebody has been doing this as a passion project for a long time and needs some material support, institutional resources, benefactors, and then maybe a collaborator. To do this work means to commit to doing it with humility, and that means not columbusing somebody else's life work because you heard about it at a talk. This is not to warn you away from sharing your skills, especially if they are archival skills, writing and creating websites, not in green font in a yellow background, fundraising, making phone calls or scheduling and creating opportunities for connection. To approach this work as a helper is to never try to get famous for it. To give up chasing things down for a credit or a byline. It may be true that you do this work and that people outside of your indigenous collaborators never even know. But as the climate change predictions for the heavy consequences of living unsustainably and arrogantly, out of pocket loom closer and closer, we might be talking about something more valuable than credit or fame. Because colonization on Turtle Island has meant the theft of indigenous land, decolonization will necessarily mean the return of land. I'll take a big drink. Many people react to indigenous people calling for decolonization and the rematriation of our homelands as being too lofty, too idealistic. Yet for indigenous people, decolonization is absolutely realistic, practical, and hopeful. What content knowledges do we need to teach people to return land to indigenous peoples? This is the more speculative part of my talk. <laughs> what do people need to know about them, about indigenous people, to return land? Or relearn about indigenous people to return land? What do people need to know about themselves to return land? For the past six years, I have collaborated with a non-Indigenous community organization that is preparing to return land. Emeritus teacher, education scholar, and novelist Christine Sleeter 
returned funds she inherited from the theft and sale of indigenous land to Ute people in Utah. In a 2018 blog post, Leader writes that she is trying to keep track of other white people repatriating land to indigenous communities. In 1991, a couple in Rhode Island returned 350 acres to the Narragansett people. In 2015, a California landowner returned 700 acres to the Poma Kaisha tribe. In 2016, the son of an artist transferred the deed of a $4 million home in Manhattan to a Lenape, Lenape nonprofit. In 2018, a Nebraska couple returned land along the trade of, uh, Trail of Tears to Ponca tribes of Nebraska and Oklahoma. Also in 2018, a man returned land in Colorado to Ute people. You can read about all of these repatriations on Christine Slater's blog. Now, somebody in this audience, maybe out there on TV land, has a question rising in them. How do you know that the tribes will do something good with that land? How do you know that they aren't just going to do something extractive and capitalistic on it? And the final content knowledge that I'm trying to get at here is the quieting of the arrogance to require answers to those questions in order to return land. Settler societies have used the logics of manifest destiny, that pe white people have been destined by God to have dominion over this part of the planet, and eminent domain, the seizing of parcels of land for public use, as justifications for stealing indigenous land. These logics are threaded in the presumption that indigenous people likely won't use the land well. It is these same patently false logics that were used to justify land theft in the first place. Today, I have discussed several content knowledges that I believe would make a difference in terms of justice for indigenous peoples. These include the understanding that settler colonialism is ongoing, accurate and respectful information about indigenous communities upon whose lands we live and work, land-based knowledges and protocols about how to do things in a good way, relating to land and re returning land. I have tried to engage the question of what content knowledges do teachers need to learn as earnestly as I can. But it is important to note, too, that there are knowledges that teachers bring to the classroom that they need to stop relying on. It would be harmful for a teacher to boast about what they know, especially if they are in the position to know more about an indigenous community than a child or an elder from that community. It is harmful to continue to believe that white people must have a say in how land they return to indigenous people should be used or to have a say in how indigenous people use land more broadly. It is harmful to treat indigenous knowledges, which are rooted in dynamic relations between human and more than human persons, land and water, and a realm that is more than we can observe, as static, as in the past, and not still in formation, as extractable. Finally, it is harmful to consider the indigenous children in our classrooms, as my teacher did, as any less real than the indigenous people who were living here in 1491, in the 1600s, in the 1970s, or any point in time. Our relationships to land and waters continue, even through the removals, the toxifications, the salinations, and the warming and the stunning world-ending consequences of settler clon uh, colonialism's consumption. To teach otherwise is to become yet another one of those teachers who lied. assuming y'all need to go make dinner and that's why people are moving out. You got kids to pick up. I'm not going to take it personally. I understand. We're juggling. Um, good evening. <laughs> 
afternoon. Um, so, honored to be here, happy to be a part of this conversation. Um, I'm going to share a few things, um, not nearly as elegantly as Eve. I know I was in trouble when they told me I was going after her. Um, but I'm going to share a few things that hopefully will be kind of food for thought this afternoon, and then we can have some conversation about um, the, the full swath of ideas that have been presented. I want to start with um, two apologies, though um, my mentor has told me never to start a talk with an apology, but maybe I'm old enough to ignore them sometimes. Um, the first apology is that um, I can't stay for Q&A after um, I got to catch a flight, and I want to eat a little bit and have a drink with Eve and the um, and Deborah and Simona before I do that. So we're all going to roll out right at six. So if you were hoping to catch an individual moment, that's not going to happen. But I did bring a stack of cards, and you're welcome to email me, and, and I'll respond. And I'm sure others will as well. The, the second apology, more to the point around the talk, is I don't think I answered the question at all. <laughs> I think I might have blatantly ignored it. Um, and then I thought about why did I do that? Like, because you answered it so beautifully and directly. Um, and I think it's partly because I got caught in the, in the definitions. Like, content knowledge is about what one needs to know and how people have organized fields of knowledge that know things in certain ways. And I can't disconnect that effectively from how one knows and assumptions about who one is and what knowledge is valuable or what, what valuable knowledge is or what counts as content and disciplines and who gets to say what counts. I think there's an interesting thing about the naming of disciplines that we do when we talk about content knowledge or what is or isn't content knowledge. And so I'm just talking about stuff. Like important stuff, stuff that I think is important. And you can decide if you think it's content knowledge or dispositions or whatnot. Um, so let's see. Um, so I want to talk um, today about how race and racialization show up in schools and classrooms. And I, and I kind of want to say at the beginning, because I realized this when I was preparing the talk, like I'm tired of talking about race. I'm, I'm tired of pointing out the way that race matters for learning, the way schools operate as racialized institutions to marginalize and oppress and, and limit the, the developmental potential of young people. And we, and I, and I think other scholars, keep talking about it because it keeps being really critical and important. And the children that we love keep being hurt. Right? And so I'm not talking about it because I, I enjoy that conversation, <laughs> though there's some theoretical fun things in what I'm going to share. Um, but I wanted to just say that because I was feeling that as I was preparing, like, oh, do we still have to keep talking about this? Yes, we still have to keep talking about this. Um, it reminds me of something one of, my, one of my kids said as I was preparing for an AERA meeting, I think either last year or the year before, and... Um, I'm preparing a talk, and I'm telling her about the talk. She's 18 at the time. And she was like, so, Mommy, I have a question. You and all your friends, because I was telling her about who's going to be there, all of my friends that are going to be at AERA. And you and your friends, you've been doing all this work all these years, and schools are getting worse. And she looked at me like, <laughs> what's the deal? You seem to be wasting your entire career. Um, so this, all of these ideas may fall into that category. Um, but I hope that we can hold this part about what our work possibly means for changing systems, either over like immediate spaces of time or over longer spaces of time. Um, okay, so that's all I'll say there. And let me just set my timer. Oh, I think I said it at the beginning. Um, okay. So I wanted to start with a couple of kind of big ideas that I feel like undergird a lot of what I say and think and write about, and so I keep coming back to them. The first is this, and this comes from um, Lonnie Guineer's work and ideas and legacy. Um, she, Lonnie Guineer makes the point that, um, that there's a key assumption that we have to make if we're going to move as a society towards equity. And that assumption is this, that talent is equally 
distributed across populations. And that means all kinds of talent, right? Artistic talent, intellectual talent, academic talent, athletic talent, equally distributed across populations. And, and so what that means is that where you see unequal outcomes, that's not a function of how the talent was distributed, it's a function of how the talent was developed, right? So it's a function of how we organize access to the development of talent. And we can take issue with the term talent, it signals lots of things that I don't really mean, but I just wanted to, but I think this idea is super powerful for me because inequality only makes sense when we buy the idea that talent's unequally distributed. Some people are better at this and some people are better at that. That's true at the individual level, that's not true at the level of groups. Right? So th the second idea that I wanna signal is that schools are really complicated places. Schools, they, they, they have this really interesting property where as institutions, they have the capacity to both reproduce social inequality and to disrupt social inequality, and indeed they do both, sometimes simultaneously. And so as we're thinking about hope and possibility and harm and the, the kind of tragic things that happen in school, it's really complicated. It's not a kind of either or, and we need to hold both of those things simultaneously. Um, so I, I've spent a good part of my career trying to think about and understand and theorize how race and racialization matter for learning. And so here's what I learned over the past 20 years. <laughs> the first is that um, race and racialization matter um, almost first and primarily um, in that access is unequally distributed, right? So access to high quality instruction and the, and the differential access to high quality instruction is the key way that race structures learning experiences. And we know, I won't go into detail on any of this, that, that there are disparities along every dimension by race as well as social class um, that you could imagine. The second, though, that I'm gonna focus on a little more today is that those disparities in access to high quality instruction, high quality learning environments, which are, which are systematic. I just finished um, touring a high school the, the high school in Evanston, which is um, amazing on many levels, but also an exercise in inequality between districts. They've done a lot of work in Evanston actually around equity within their district, which is, is part of what I found interesting. Um, but the level of access and privilege and resources, I, I won't go into detail because I don't have time, but um, it was for me an example that underscored that this is entirely about access. And so we're we've been very careful as a society to structure access differentially to maintain the social reproductive function of schools. Okay, identity. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus today much more on the second part, which is connected to the first part, right? In, in that um, as we offer differential access to high quality learning environments. We also offer differential access to people to have identities as learners. And if you don't do the second part, the first part doesn't make sense. So they kind of have to be done together because they reinforce one another, right? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's also a point, you know, another big um, thing that I feel like I've tried to take up in my career is thinking about connections between the micro and the macro. Like how does the organization of society um, impact what happens at the, in these micro learning moments? And so identities for me is a nice construct to look across those levels. And, and one of the um, ways I think, one of the things about that that I find super fascinating is this notion of racial storylines. And so how is it that our narratives, our stories about what race is and who people are reinforces the types of access we give them and becomes this way that we bring the disparities of the broader society into schools and into learning moments. So, so my point is, is about these two kinds of processes and the ways, ways that they're connected, and I'm gonna focus on this access to learning identities piece. Um, 
So I talked about it a minute ago. Um, I think a lot about what we've written about and called racial storylines. Some people talk about these as stereotypes. I like to think about them as storylines story because they are racial narratives that are lived, that are used, that are invoked, that are active and alive. One of the things I loved about what you were saying, Eve, is the idea that these processes that we talk about that create disparity are not processes rooted, they're not processes of the past, they are processes of the present that we continue to reify and recreate. And so storylines for me is one mechanism by which that recreation continues to happen. Um, they, are also, they, they are also mechanisms of oppression. Right? They're artifacts that organize our perceptions, our opinions, our actions. So it's also, I think, important for me to acknowledge that all of this, the learning environments that we're creating, the ways that kids are making sense of themselves and one another in classrooms as learners, is deeply connected to this, this um, the context, the local context, the national context, the global context. And it just struck me again as I was thinking about, about today and this talk, that it's important to acknowledge that we are in this national moment that's characterized by some really key trends. One, we are in a moment where there is an incredibly high level and growing level of social and educational inequality. Inequality is not staying stable, it's growing tremendously. That's what that red line is, is the percent change in tax income, the top 1%. So we are in, a, in an era of unprecedented inequality, wealth inequality, and everything else follows from there, right? We are also in a moment where there are powerful public new old narratives about race, that children in schools, adults in workplaces, all of us in society are having to navigate every day. Um, and, and, and as those things are happening, we're in this moment of the, the changing national demographics so that the student populations we are serving least well will be the majority of the population of the United States within 30 years. So all of this to say to me, this rethinking the endeavor that we're engaged in is absolutely dire. And, and I think it's also important to say that then if this is the context, the work we're asking teachers and schools and school districts and administrators to do in this context is about disruption. And it's about creating new <laughs> trends through this disruption. And I think that's important because if we assume that the broader context is kind of neutral, that's a very different task for what we're asking teachers and schools to do than if we acknowledge this is about creating a groundswell to move things in the opposite direction that they're going if we do nothing. Um, so, I've been thinking recently about where, what it means to humanize and what it means to dehumanize. Because um, when I think about race and even the very function of race as a category of thing, um, the construction of race serves the function of dehumanizing some people and humanizing others. That's why the construct exists in the first place, to say some folks are worthy of being treated as fully human and others are not worthy of being treated as, as fully human. That's the, the rationale for, for chattel slavery. And one of the ways I think that we dehumanize contemporarily is by not acknowledging or meeting students' very human developmental needs. We know a lot, I, I, most of my work is on adolescents, we know a lot about what adolescents need developmentally, right? They need to be having a sense of competence and autonomy, I'm good at something, I can be independent. They need to experience a sense of care and community that they are held in community and in warmth and in connection with others. And they're working hard to figure out who they are and where they fit in the world. And so if these are core tasks, what do we, this is my child, my youngest child. There, I have many children. This is the one that's still at home and the only, the only male child. Um, and, and he's 14, so he's in the midst of this moment. And different than, than my daughter's for, for all kinds of reasons, because some of the stuff is gendered, he's in this moment where I can see this set of developmental needs expressing themselves. <clears throat> 
And I can see that right at this moment when he's having these needs, the world is giving him the exact opposite of what one would give if you were taking those needs seriously, right? So as adolescents need to feel trusted, respected, competent, we treat them with suspicion, right? He walks down the street and it's the classic people grabbing their purses and which, you know, anyway. Um, as, as young people need fewer directives and more autonomy, we increase control of their bodies and activities. As, as young people need more connection, black and brown youth are othered by teachers and administrators and by kind of systematic disciplinary practices. As they need to have room to make more mistakes and explore, they're adultified and expected to behave as older than they are and not accorded the benefit of doubt when mistakes are made. When they need a sense of belonging and identity, they are vilified and again treated as being under suspicion. And, and so for me, this is an interesting um, example of the way, of, of the concrete ways dehumanization happens in schools for black and brown youth. And, and the identity work then that young people need to do in learning spaces in relation to those processes gets really complicated. So part of what I'm trying to talk about in a roundabout kind of way is the connection between processes of learning and processes of identity and the way in which they are deeply intertwined. So this is my new graphic to, um, to express this. I was giving a talk at NSF a couple of weeks ago and I had a terrible graphic and I was like, I just, I really need a better way to show these relationships. And at the end of the talk, this woman came up with a drawing which I gave to my sister who's a graphic artist and she made this. So shout out to the woman who made the drawing. I didn't bring her card so I can't say her name and my sister Estrella Jones who did the, <laughs> who did the picture. Um, but what this shows is that identity and learning recreate one another in the process of learning moments. And sometimes that happens in a way that strengthens both a sense of identity and a sense of learning. And sometimes it happens in a way that invites people off the learning path or off the identity path. And, um, and, and how we approach um, the organization of classrooms, the organization of instruction, the way we create opportunities for students in classrooms impacts what that cycle looks like. Uh, and so, how can teaching then support racial identities, right? And I, and I think there are two types of mechanisms, two types of ways this can look. One is by supporting learning identities. The other is by, by supporting reframed and expanded racial identities, racial identities that push back on some of the typical storylines. And I have examples of what both of those look like that I'll go through super briefly. But what I'm trying to argue is that you can, um, you can impact this cycle at both the identity place and the learning place, right? So if you support opportunities for people to learn in effective and expansive ways, that is gonna automatically support new kinds of identities opening up in a learning space. If you support new kinds of identities opening up in a learning space, you invite people to engage in learning in new ways. So I wanna give one example of each of those types and then I will close out so we can have some good conversation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two different studies. Study that, that for me is an example of folks creating new opportunities for learning identities and thus supporting other kinds of identities along the way is a study of a um, high school in California that's known in the research literature as Railside, super diverse. They spent many years building an equity curriculum. Um, what do I want to say of this? And, and had maybe the most important thing on this slide is the bullet at the bottom, that they actually did it. Right, that it worked, that they had an equity pedagogy in mathematics that meant, that, that allowed them to create outcomes by which, by the end of senior year, um, race and gender gaps were eliminated, both in course taking patterns and achievement, in, in, in achievement outcomes. Um, and so how did they do that? They did that with a set of really important underlying assumptions. Um, one, that all teachers and students are learners that they were working from strengths, but making space for vulnerability, which meant recognizing the strengths that all kids brought into the room and yet making space for learning to be a vulnerable space. 
by redefining what counted as smart and whose smartness got counted, right? And by redefining what it meant to do math in school, what it, what it meant to be a math learner, and by really prioritizing relationships between adults and children and between young people and other young people in the space. I have more I could say about that, but I'm, I'm not going to, so I can come back to that later in, in Q&A if you like. Um, and and so, so that's about kind of the philosophy of what they did. And then they like did some things, like really organized teaching and learning in, in new kinds of ways um, that included spending a lot of time developing and cultivating a teacher professional community where they were intentional about their goals to reduce inequality. Um, that meant um, organizing the school day into block schedules so that there was time, which meant a couple things. It meant they could engage curriculum that was about deep teaching and learning and concepts. And it meant that if you failed a class, because it meant that you, you took whole classes in a semester rather than a year, you could fail a class and still get to calculus by senior year, right? Um, and then other kinds of things within the teaching practice. And my point here is that, it, that this was not a place where teachers were talking explicitly with young people about race or racial identity. But it was a place that disrupted this differential access to, lear to, to learning identities through race by providing people with a sense of themselves as math learners, deeply and fundamentally. And, and, and in doing so, sending the message that, that is, it is not the case that only some of us get to show up as math learners, that actually all of us show up as math learners because that identity as a math learner was the only one you could take up in these classrooms. So alternatively, um, I studied a program that I have a, this book, oh, that's not the picture with the book, it's on the next slide, um, just came out about this last month, um, of a, of a race-based program in Oakland that focused on African-American male students, where the focus of the work was around supporting racial identities such that students could engage classrooms and schools in new kinds of ways, and not in the way that you think, like I, I there was a question earlier today about how you worry about how your work can be taken up um, in ways that you did not intend. And so this is one of those places for me where the point of this work wasn't about fixing the broken black males. The point of this work was about helping young people navigate the challenges that society and schools put upon them due to their blackness and maleness. <laughs> right? So anyway, this is a program um, that was focused on dis district-wide supporting the achievement of black male students in Oakland. And one of the ways they did that was by creating these school spaces, um, these classroom spaces within the school day, all black, all male spaces, where they talked in really intentional um, and, and cultivated ways about identity. They did lots of things in these classrooms. We wrote a book about what characterized the classrooms. Let's cover the book, which is the picture I just... Love never let the publisher give you a picture, come with your own image. Um, and these classrooms were, were characterized by what we argue four key things. One, that the teaching philosophy was rooted in a commitment to humanization and love and creating loving spaces for black male students. Two, that they, one of the ways that they did that, one of the key ways that they did that is creating new norms and processes around Discipline. Discipline is one of the places of dehumanization in particular for black male students. And so doing discipline differently was key in their approach. Three, they did a lot of work, really intentional and um, explicit work, debunking and reframing these racial storylines about black males and engaged the young kid, the men and boys in that work. And they built this really deep, connected, loving community around young people. And I'm not going to say more about that, um, but I can. I, I, I want to think, though, with you a little bit, and, and I've written about both of those studies, so there's lots of stuff out there. If you're like, well, you didn't tell us very much, there's so much more out there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we, because it's one thing to think about what classrooms look like that are humanizing, where identity and learning support one another, where you can interrupt these negative racialized storylines, or where you can create access to learning identities and content learning in new ways. 
That work, though, doesn't happen on its own. It has to be, the structures for that have to be created at the school level and at the district level. And so I was thinking a little bit about what, the, what, that, what those requirements are, and I, this is what I came up with, um, that the work needs to, that, that people need to have an intentional priority on equity and on disrupting inequity. So people need to be committed to doing things differently, to seeing different outcomes, to creating different processes, to saying this is actually really important as we imagine the future of our school space, that we, are, um, that we imagine a future where we're not sorting by, by race and social class. Uh, then structural practices need to be in place that support identity work. Again, partly because, maybe I'll say identity and equity work, but partly because identity becomes such a key issue in the ways that schools operate. And so a practice like tracking is not just about access to content, it's about access to a sense of yourself as a learner, right? So structuring new kinds of practices that includes detracking, integrating classes, um, creating teacher professional development communities around that, hiring practices and, and structures that support student belonging. That the work also needs to be undergirded by a belief in the potential of all students and the understanding of the education debt. I think one of the things that prevents people from doing work along these lines is that we tend to approach what happens in schools and what happens in society ahistorically because that makes us feel I don't know, less, um, less constrained, less guilty, less worried about our ability to impact change. But actually, our work needs to be rooted in a deep understanding of history, including a history, uh, a deep understanding of what Gloria Ladson Billings has written about as the education debt. And then finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, willingness to disrupt structures of privilege. Because again, um, Inequality and the privileging of some groups to the expense of others happens because the whole endeavor is set up to protect the privilege of some, right? To protect and um, reproduce white privilege. And, and in doing so, it rectifies, I mean, it, and, and so a commitment to disrupt means a commitment to rectifying both unearned advantage and undeserved challenge. So what does all this mean for teacher education? Um, I would argue that it means racial literacy needs to be a key aspect of teacher education and not in that way that like this is something good we do for those other kids that don't look like us, but in the way of this is something that's actually mandatory if we're doing the work of creating the society that we want together. Um, that it requires deep support in unlearning everyday racism that it requires viewing identity work as deeply connected to content learning, that it requires training support in how to, how to support healthy racial identities to create classrooms with new norms, again, in the context of society that does not do so. Right? So it, it, it requires being committed to creating these counter spaces. Um, it requires diversifying the teaching force in, intentionally and creating contexts where collective work is fundamentally about equity. And I am going to end there and um, looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tuck and Dr. Nasir. So now we're going to take about five minutes. You're going to think about all the things that you just heard and learned about and from our two visitors, our panelists. You talk for a moment or two with the person next to you and tweet um, your questions out. And I'll invite Deborah and Eve to join Naila here at the front. And in a few moments, we'll, um, Deborah will start and we'll moderate. Again, the Twitter handle that you will use is TW Seminar. So you'll tweet your, com your questions to the Twitter handle TW Seminar. <laughs>
teaching and explicitly teaching students to uh, own names. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, right, and that experience is Okay, so we're going to come back together. You can continue to tweet if it so moves you to do so. And um, I'm going to turn back to my colleagues to, to take up the, the conversations we've just begun. TW Seminar. So it's hashtag, hashtag TW Seminar. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of um, hubbub in the room, especially right behind where I was sitting, so I'm optimistic about what's going to be coming my way. Um, I thought I might ask, start by asking, um, thank you both so much. I just really, I personally feel like I have a lot to think about and appreciated both the people each did, so thank you. I thought I might ask, start by asking you each what question you might have for the person, your partner here, your co-speaker co here, mm -hmm. and that might kick us off. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> I can start. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> um, so one of the things that struck me in your talk was you used this term, indigenous futurity, mm -hmm. and it made me think about how important it is that we collectively, if we're really committed to thinking about schooling and new and transformative and deeply just ways that there's a, a future that we can imagine. And not just a future that we can imagine, but some sense of then how we get there. So I wanted to, this may be too big of a question, but if you have any thoughts towards what does it look like to get to the indigenous futurity that you can imagine? Like what are some of the practices, policies, what would we put in place differently? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the, the, the challenges and the um, real, I'll say challenges again, one of the things that I am confronted by as I read in Indigenous Studies and read in the understandings of time and place from particular Indigenous communities mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that challenges me, and it's, all, I mean, sometimes uh, I love to read in indigenous 
uh, speculative fiction and black feminist speculative fiction, but sometimes the understandings of time, because they are not linear mm. and because they don't understand there to be a past, a coherent past, a coherent present and a coherent future, really interrupt the things that I take for granted in terms of being a thinker and a, and a learner. Mm. And uh, so I, I keep using the word challenge. Sometimes I'm just like, oh my gosh, is, is that, uh, what, what would it mean for that to really be possible and to take creation stories seriously and take understandings of time as going in, sometimes in a circle or sometimes in other shapes and not align very seriously. Mm -hmm. And so when I am using the word futurities, it's to invoke the idea that in both uh, the, the, uh, both my mother's community and in um, communities that I am in relation to, time is not understood as linear mm -hmm. or as in progressing. And also to mark from work that I've read from Andrew Baldwin and others that futurity is a way, of, is different than the future because it's talking about what we are doing right now to make possible different futures. Mm. And when I bring those two ideas together, it makes me think that there's not, uh, and, and then when I think about uh, Lisa Lowe, who's reading Saeed, in order to talk about contrapuntal readings, in which when we look at the past from a different vantage point, the past also isn't what we thought it was. Mm -hmm. Like, all the, you know, the, when we were, uh, remove all the kind of noise from like from the conqueror's vantage point that there are other people who have always been resisting this and always been fighting against the ways that society is currently constructed and so what happens when we tell stories of, about the past and what kinds of possible futures are made um, into reality when we don't ignore those, mm -hmm. those voices. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, I love the way that reading in indigenous studies really, um, again, I don't know the other word, I, I experience almost like a bodily uh, interruption. Uh, I really have to think differently. It takes, it takes work for me to really go there with an author, really go there with a teacher, and stay with it, like this is, um, this is the way that the world works. And um, so that makes me not feel like I, we can say right now what that shared future is gonna be. Mm -hmm. It makes me understand that, um, this is why the idea of contingent collaboration is important to me because I think that there are things that we can agree rather than solidarity, which asks you to promise everything up front. I think we can, in contingent collaboration, agree to go on the road with each other a little bit and see how far that takes us, and then mm -hmm. like understand that there might be parts that we can't do together, and and mm -hmm. but we won't know what those are until we're there. And so I li I like the idea of thinking about vantage points that we get to. That there's sometimes when we're um, making a path that sometimes we'll get to a vantage point, and it's only from that vantage point that we can even see what's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I know that what colonization has meant for indigenous people and what anti-black uh, so social structures have meant for black people and descendants of enslaved people have meant that the, the vantage points mm -hmm. have been taken from us. And so we don't even know the ways that we might otherwise be arranged except for like that strong feeling in our, in our bellies mm -hmm. that we know that it can be different. Yeah. I wanted to talk, um, one thing that I noticed and liked to, uh, liked to notice was the ways that we're both talking about relationships mm -hmm. and the importance of um, relationships in that beautiful graphic, the, the identity and learning graphic that you shared with us. I wondered if, we, if you might think out loud a bit about if so much is important in writing on making relationship, what happens and what might be done between a, a, a teacher and 
students or um, between a school and a group of students? What mm -hmm. might happen, how might we understand differently what we should do when we break relationship? Mm. Like I, I think yeah. that part of the, yeah. the, the, my sense is that it's not just that relationships aren't made, it's that relationships are broken. Right, like your story. Yeah, right. and, then, yeah. and then we're supposed to act like they weren't broken. Right. And so right. What, what might you offer right. around ideas about what to do when a relationship has been broken? Mm -hmm. What, what yeah. does your work do? It's so about interesting. That? It's what occurred to me was the ways in which institutions, in, schooling institutions, for some young people, create mostly brokenness. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? The ways that mostly like, broken relationships, broken relationships mm -hmm. that that the relationships don't even have a chance to come back to some mm -hmm. whole healed space because the breaking keeps happening. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that, if I can set that aside for a moment, um, I don't know if I can, because then also <laughs> the breaking of relationship is sutured in. It's not layered on top, in, meaning that the institutional structures, the way people are arranged vis-a-vis -vis one another, the whole thing is rooted in breaking relationship for some and holding it for others, breaking it for many. Um, but I guess to take your question seriously <laughs> would require first to agree that, in a, that there would be a commitment to holding and sustaining relationship. And if there's a commitment to holding and sustaining relationship, then what happens when it's broken should be an opportunity for repair, restoration, re-equilibrium. And, and I do think there are teachers who think about their interactions with students this way. Mm -hmm. Like how they're, you know, that, that if you're a parent, you sometimes think about your reactions with your kids this way. Mm -hmm. That when there's a break, and you might even gamble that you can, you can, um, you can push to an almost breaking point mm -hmm. because you know you can do the repair and hold that relationship. I was thinking just now of a track coach that I studied who talked about how he spent a lot of time building relationship with, with his track athletes and making sure that they felt close to him and connected to him and they could talk to them about their day. And, and partly why he did that was because track is really hard and that if you're going to support the development of really great athletes, you have to push people beyond their comfort zone. And so he saw that as an, kind of an investment and then pushing people right to the edge, but the relationship that he established held them through that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. those were the thoughts that occurred. Yeah. I wanted to ask about it because one thing that I've learned, um, not just in thinking about relationships in my own research practice and also mentoring other students to think about relationships and, and ac being in academia mm -hmm. as being about uh, attending to our relationships and being in good relation mm -hmm. is that I think that the message sometimes people take away is the idea that we need to be perfect mm. and the, yeah, the expectation mm. is right. perfection right. and so right. I, I think it's important yeah. for us to think about what are the practices of attending to broken relationships right. and when, yeah. when, when a break has happened what do we do and yeah. it's something that I would yeah. love um, to be a part of ways that teacher educators are working yeah, with, yeah. with teachers to think about. Because yeah. of course it's not about being perfect, it's about being authentic and yes. full in your humanity, mm -hmm. which um, acknowledges and um, respects the humanity of others. So um, there are questions coming in now on the curated thread. And some of them um, that have come in have a little to do with teachers. Um, in the following sense. So currently teacher preparation programs are engaged in a practice of excluding people from teaching and including others on the basis of grade point average, other kind of scores and measures. But several people are wondering whether from your perspectives, uh, I'll give a couple of examples, whether there's a very different way we should be thinking about whom we allow to teach children. For example, mm -hmm. one person asked that the 
implication of what you've been talking about suggests that we need to think about a kind of code of ethics or an ethical mm -hmm. set of ethical mm -hmm. stances and that people might be denied from the privilege of teaching children if they somehow mm -hmm. aren't constant mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Someone else asked, yeah. um, given the various things you said about knowing or how we know or who knows or what to know, are there bases on which you would change I assume you might change, but on what basis might you then decide who who should be learning to teach, who should be teaching? Mm -hmm. And so there was kind of an invitation to think a little bit more about something we didn't talk that much about today, mm -hmm. that you know, huge mismatches about who our teachers are, and in some sense it's also even a question about what do you believe can be learned, mm -hmm. and what is it that we hope or want people to bring with them in this project of learning to Mm -hmm. people who can do these things. So yeah. I think there are a lot of places to enter that, but there's several people asking questions about that. Yeah. Well, I can start with a really interesting example, actually, from the work that I talked about, the manhood development work in Oakland. When they recruited teachers for that program, they initially thought they would recruit existing teachers in the middle schools and high schools who were black males. And they immediately found that there weren't any, or there were so few that that was not a sustainable way to staff the program. And so they had to figure out a different way of recruiting people to do this work, and they've evolved a really elaborate system for how they recognize um, what they view as, um, as kind of the prerequisite skill set to do this work. And they talk about it as a skill set. I don't know that's, if that's the way the field would talk about it, because what they say is, and I, what they say, I have slides about that, but what they say is that we recruit people to be teachers here that love the kids, that see potential, not deficit, that want to commit their life's work to supporting and loving young people. So the, the way they talk about it sounds almost like a code of ethics, right? But they see that as a skill set. And what they say is we hire for will and train for, and train for skill. Right? Like that we, we hire for people who want to and have a deep commitment to this work. And if you have that, we can teach you the details of what the curriculum looks like and pedagogical approaches. And, but if you don't have that, we can't, we can't use you at all. Um, which I think, again, goes back to the, the beginning of my comments and thinking about what we, what we count as valid skill sets. We might, there's a possibility to think about those differently. Um, so, when I was working as a professor at my prior institution, I worked for seven years as a teacher educator. And one of the things that I wish that we could figure out um, is how, and it seems almost impossible, um, but how do you get people who hated school to become teachers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one, you know, sort of root of the conundrum mm -hmm. to me right. is that uh, for, for students who experience uh, really antagonistic or hostile learning environments as children or as teenagers, how, how, how is there any way that they would ever want to have a career in, mm -hmm. in, in a place that, that really spoke against their personhood in that way? And so I feel like that is something that schools of education could actively try. What would that program look like where you're trying to recruit people who hated school? What would that look like when you're trying to craft a program to meet the needs of people who, and you address the fact that their needs were not met as learners when they were children? What does that kind of uh, repair work look like with the schools of education that prepared those teachers that then were violent to them in their classrooms. What responsibility do schools of education have to, as people who prepared the teachers that disrespected them when they were children? And so to, to think of the, the reparation work that un, uh, universities might do in order to create programs for children who didn't get what they deserved from their teachers. Um, I think about this in, in Canada in terms of what universities' responsibilities are to residential school survivors. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, you know, what, what are our responsibilities to people who were denied education? Um, I think it's 
I'm a little bit worried about using the point of admission to um, make make a determination of whether somebody or not sh should be a teacher or not. I do wish that it was more common practice for people to be counseled out. I think we need to like be more transparent and activated around counseling people out of teacher education programs. Like this doesn't seem like it's for you. This this maybe isn't a good fit. You should do something else neat, but not this. Uh, and I think, so I would like to have a more active and robust practice of counseling people out and not have that be like a shameful conversation that happens and like maybe the professor who's an assistant professor isn't gonna be backed up because we're supposed to keep numbers up or something like this. So the whole dynamics of understanding that it's our responsibility to make sure that the right people get into the classroom. Um, and that that isn't resting at the point of admission, like just because you get in doesn't mean that you should be in a classroom several years later. And then I know that big worry, and, and um, I agree that, especially when it's um, uh, poor and low income schools and schools with lots of kids of color and black and indigenous kids going there, that they have like um, very high, rates of leaking out that, you know, people talk about this as a revolving door. But I, I also want to think of retention mm -hmm. as maybe not always the problem that we think it is. Mm -hmm. um, it is, of course, a problem if it's leaking out the students, or excuse me, leaking out the, or pushing out teachers that we would want to keep. Um, in my dissertation, I studied school push, in, push out, and I learned that the conditions of schools that push out students are the same conditions that push out their teachers mm -hmm. that we would others, well, otherwise want to have there. But similarly, I wish that it was, I don't know really if there are teacher lounges anymore. I imagine that there are teacher lounges, but at the bar or wherever people hang out afterwards, I wish that teachers would say to each other, maybe you shouldn't be a teacher. Sounds like maybe this isn't what you should be doing anymore. I wish that people would counsel each other out of this practice um, so that we're not just like tolerating and knowing that next door our, our students are being harmed before they come and spend their period with us. Maybe I'll say one, one more thing about that. I know there are other questions, but in, in this program that, that recruited teachers who had primarily been working in community-based organizations, who had a love for the kids and not necessarily an ex expertise around pedagogy, they brought them in, but then they also created a professional community of love around the instructors that they talk about mm -hmm. as such. Mm -hmm. And they talk about it as a place where they are, um, where their teacher training that happens it's like a week-long thing in the summer before the school year starts. They talk about that as, um, I wish I could remember the exact words, um, as what, what, what love looks like in practice, right? What love looks like in teaching practice, or taking love and translating it into teaching practice. It's some, some version of that. And, and I guess I just want to add there that there's the point about who you bring in, and whether they should be there, but there's also the point about what sustains people to do this work. And I think we see, we've seen over and over again in the literature that what sustains people to do this work is being a part of a, of a community of people doing this work. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's a really important part of this. It's a, I mean, it's an interesting dilemma that you're framing because on one hand, you started with a story of great harm in a moment. Mm -hmm and those moments aren't infrequent. Mm -hmm. So we want, on one hand, to believe that some of the things we're talking about can be learned, can be sustained in communities, and can be supported. But there are also great harm that can be done even while people are learning. So balancing that question of you know, counseling someone out who's doing harm, or having belief that with support, someone can keep learning and improving from mistakes. How do you balance that? Because the objects of the mistake are human beings who can be really hurt as those mistakes are made. Is there any wisdom or a way of guiding that thinking? Because we protect teachers and their rights to learn, but in the end it's also about children and their rights to mm -hmm. feel human in school, the way you describe. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think that I am just beginning to learn about transformative justice um, and those kinds of processes. And then there are um, other processes of addressing when harm has been done that are land-based practices that come, that are taught to us by by traditional teachers or by um, by elders. And so I. I think that this is why I was curious about the question of what happens when relationship is broken, mm -hmm. uh, and whose responsibility is it. And um, and I think that it could be that in a school community, it's more than either the student's responsibility or the teacher's responsibility. But when students mm -hmm. observe that relationship has been broken, or um, uh, I mean other children in the class, or when um, when another teacher comes to know, or when somebody somebody else in the building comes to know, what can happen? What kinds of processes can be activated to acknowledge that harm has happened here? Not necessarily to um, heal the relationship between the teacher and the student, but in order to heal that student's relationship to the rest of the school. Um, so that so I, I do think that there could be something more deliberate that we do in order to acknowledge that teachers are learners, that expectation is not perfection, but that things can happen that have lifelong consequences in terms of like being up and talking in front of a group of people about something that a teacher said. You know, so, and you are the ones who are still in school, you know, and I'm sure that each one of you has a memory of something that a teacher said to you that has stayed with you. Um, and so how do we not have those, those moments have such lasting power? Um, or at least have them be accompanied with right. the memory of also trying to have done something about it, rather than it just being absorbed and like carried. One of the comments that has just come in, um, Oh, my mom. <laughs> 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 uh, my mom has tweeted. My mom is named Beverly Tuck. And she tweeted a simple breakdown of comments made by the presenters is a quote from a dynamic school leader: "Is feed the teachers so they don't eat the children." <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking Dr. Nessie and Dr. Tuck today. It's Today they both have to run away, um, so please follow up with them in other ways. And thank you so much for being here today and for participating with us. Thank you.